when you look at the energy needs for the rest of the world, there is a role for new technologies. We're going to need to have electric vehicles ramp if we're going to meet the substantial energy needs in India, Africa, and so forth. So nothing I'm saying is a knock on the need for new technologies. In fact, just the opposite. It's pretty clear as energy needs grow, we are going to need all the different ways we can get modern energy, including the new stuff. My critique is usually with thinking we can get rid of the old stuff at any point in time before the new stuff's ready for prime time. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast featuring the icons and entrepreneurs of technology, commodities and finance, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we examine the questions, are we facing a crisis of information or a crisis of trust? And will building smarter markets be the antidote? This episode is brought to you in part by Abax Exchange, bringing you better benchmarks, better technology, and better tools for risk management. Welcome back to our Smarter Markets Summer Playlist 2023, where we're sitting down with our special guests midway through the year to talk about where we are and where we might be and need to be heading next. It's our Beach Reading in a Podcast. I'm Dave Greeley, Chief Economist at Abex Technologies. Our guest today is Arjun Murdy, the former head of equity research on the energy sector at Goldman Sachs, partner at Veriton, and the publisher of Super Spiked on Substack. We'll be catching up with Arjun midway through the year to get his thoughts on where we are in the energy super vol cycle. Hello, Arjun. Welcome back to Smarter Markets. David, it's always great to be here with you. Thank you for having me back on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was so great to have you here to kick off the year, kick off 2023 with us in January. And now we're midway through the year, and I'm really thrilled that you could pop back in with us to talk about how the year's been unfolding and where we might be heading next. So why don't we start there, Arjun? How would you characterize the first half of 2023 in the energy markets? And how does it look through the lens of your SuperVol thesis that we talked about back in January? Yeah, thanks, David. I think that SuperVol thesis is is sort of the place to start. And I might take you back sort of over the last two years, inclusive of the last six months, which is we had that nice run coming out of COVID, then Russia, Ukraine, that took oil from 60 to 120. And we've now been in a correction mode. And it has been the core part of our framework, which is super vol, not super cycle. Now, mercifully, David, I do not have published oil forecasts. I know you don't either. And I don't think either of us <laughs> missed doing that. So this is not about me trying to pat myself on the back at all. It is about the framework and how I think companies, investors, policymakers should think about things, which is... I don't believe super cycle is the correct terminology. I think in an environment where there is uncertainty in the three major oil consuming countries on the economic outlook, China, Europe, and the US, and in a world where there's lots of cross currents on the pace of decarbonization and some of these trends, and there's uncertainty in a number of the different key supply basins, I think this is the kind of environment we're going to be in. So we got to 120 from that reaction. We had a surge in the U.S. rig count, mostly from private producers. We've had sort of a little extra U.S. shale supply this year. We've had some SPR releases. We've had Guiana reamp and so forth. And you've had some economic uncertainty creep in. Demand's been okay, but it's not been booming. And so we've now pulled back. A one standard deviation move in oil is $20 a barrel. We went three standard deviations up from 60 to 120. We've now pulled back two and a half standard deviations. And I think, not surprising knowing you, David, your your timing is impeccable in that I think we will say perhaps we're through the worst of that correction period. You can always go down more. You can always paint pictures of harder landings if you want. But I think we are at one of those times where there's questions on when shale is going to peak. There's sort of some notion of demand is hanging in there better. And I do wonder if we've maybe not had the bulk of that correction. So I think it's an interesting time to talk. But these last two years and the last six months are emblematic of, I think, the kind of market people should expect going forward. I think it's so important, your emphasis on the super fall rather than super cycle. And I'm really glad I think the timing's working out just right to talk with you about this now, because I think still many people look at the oil prices, as you said, having gone from 120 back down to 80 and been kind of choppy around much of this year, kind of flat to down. And they ask, well, what happened to the structural bull market? And I was hoping that you could put that in context a little bit and share how you think about how structural bull markets play out and where are we in this one? I think there's actually a lot to dive into on that question. And I 
to some degree, if you, when you say super vol, are you just saying all oh, prices are going to go up and down and you want to wash your hands <laughs> of any specific? Maybe I do want to wash my hands. Of I do not miss the public price prognosticating business. I don't think you do either, David. Yeah. What I will say, though, is I've never subscribed to what I'll call the perma bear sort of outlook, which is one of demand is permanently peaked. It's going to go away due to decarbonization and other effects. And that technology, et cetera, will just allow supply to bubble out of the ground without a CapEx cycle. So I'm for sure not in that super bear category. The reason I've picked sort of super vol versus super cycle really is there is an economic uncertainty today that was not there when you and I were teammates back in the early 2000s when China was just emerging and they were clearly going up that sort of economic and GDPS curve with, by the way, a very heavy industry oil intensive type of economic growth that then fueled the kind of the big boom that we had. That's, that's not the environment today. China, if anything, has had peak population, probably peak industrialization. And so it's a different environment there. And as we're waiting for India and Bangladesh and Pakistan and other Southeast Asia and Africa to ramp up, we're in a little bit of that transition phase on the demand side. Now, I don't think demand has peaked either. And I know we'll get to that in a second. And so in an outlook of sort of steadily growing oil demand, we don't need to motivate the major kind of supply response like we were trying to do 20 years ago. And I think there is a debate of can you sort of gut it out with shale and a little bit of OPEC creep and so forth, but none of this is going to be smooth. And so overall, I expect prices to be high and volatile. That may add up to an overall good period, quote unquote, for oil prices, an overall good period for earnings and profitability for the sector. But I don't think anyone should think it's just a smooth line up. And when you and I were doing this 20 years ago, 02 to 08, was almost every year up and to the right. Whereas here, I think three standard deviations up, two standard deviations down. That is more likely to be what we expect going forward. Yeah. And I, I loved you. I'd written an article on your Substack. I think you labeled it something like PTSD <laughs> in the structural bull market. And I think there's a lot of analysts out there who have that from the, from the 2008 period. And so I, I just wanted to ask you, like, do you still have when you look at the supply side of the market, I know, as you said, there's not the the booming oil demand coming in out of China at this point. But when you look at the, the supply side of the market, does it still look fairly constrained to you? I think we are still constrained on the supply side, but the demand side is relevant. So it's one thing to declare that we're not quite having the big EM boom like we did 20 years ago. It's another thing, though, to believe, and I'm going to pick on them, the IEA's net zero by 2050 report from May of 2021. Now, that was a scenario, but I think it was a willful scenario that has been weaponized by especially folks particularly passionate about the climate. And that scenario called for oil demand to be somewhere around 75 million barrels a day in 2030. And you can call it a scenario. You can call it something that would have to happen if we we're going to have net zero by 2050. But David, it was never realistic. It was never on track to happen. You could always debate out decades through some combination of fuel economy and substitution. But in the near term, we were never, never, ever on track to have 75 million barrels a day by 2030. And the IAs put out there, it used to be called the medium term oil report. It's called something different now. And in 2028, this is a forecast, 105 million barrels a day. I mean, that's 30 million barrels a day. That's not a small number. Yeah, a 50% miss. It's a massive <laughs> delta, right? And so, hey, you and I can both attest to getting forecasts wrong, but give me a break on what I will call the ideology of that report, purposely weaponized versus the reality we're on. So I think it is remarkable, actually, that in a world where the three largest oil-consuming countries, China, Europe, US, are all facing economic uncertainty, we're on track to obliterate those net zero by 2050 type oil demand projections. It's a different discussion on how you should decarbonize and what are the steps you have to take. But from purely an oil supply demand analysis standpoint, I think it is very noteworthy that here in 2023, we're probably going to have 102 million barrels a day higher than 2019. We're on track for 104 in the next year and a half or so. And again, we are up and to the right. I think on the supply side, the big question is really about the Permian Basin and shale. This has been last decade 70, 70% of global supply. And it is showing signs of maturing. Now, some people have Permian production falling off a cliff or at least starting to decline. I don't have that. But I, I, again, I think it's noteworthy that for what counted as the, the overwhelming majority of oil supply growth, it is showing some signs of tiring a bit. And I think exactly when that peaks and how you replace it, that is why we're going to need a new CapEx cycle. We're going to have to figure out what comes after the Permian, and no one's even trying that yet. 
Yeah, and I want to get back to to that in some detail with you. But first, I kind of wanted to ask you, I mean, I don't want to press you for stock tips, but given your experience as an energy equity analyst, I'm hoping you could share, how do you think about company performance over these different stages of a, a super vol cycle or a structural bull market or however you want to talk about it? Well, maybe it just hasn't been long enough, but one of the things I'm very encouraged about when I look at sort of, I'll call it the publicly traded universe of mostly Western major oils, independent producers, refiners, services, the whole bucket of traditional energy companies is profitability continues to be doing much better than it did, again, 20 years ago, where CapEx was skyrocketing and companies were starting to erode their returns. And, and it's actually one of the things I take the greatest comfort in during what's now been a four quarter period of correction. We've had four quarters of sequentially down oil prices. And while profitability is naturally down with it, it is holding up overall much better than what we've seen in past down cycles. And I think investors should take a lot of comfort that at around $70, $75 WTI, This industry is going to have at least a 15 and it may turn out to be 17, 18% return on capital, which is an outstanding number. And so while one wouldn't normally call $75 a quote trough oil price, I think if you were to then extrapolate that down to 50, which if you have a hard landing might be a more reasonable trough, you'd expect at least still cost of capital returns eight, nine, 10% for the sector, which is a heck of a lot better than losing billions of dollars as they did during the COVID trough or even being break even. So I think that sort of profit, and I do use the super cycle language for the return on capital outlook for the sector. My preferred profitability metric, you can use anyone you want, but the idea that this sector is on track after a really bad decade in the 2010s to now have a, a kind of an above normal, if you will, decade coming forward, That, I think, is one of my biggest positive takeaways, and I think that bodes well for the sector overall. You still need to get through this short-term correction stuff, and maybe we're getting through it. The near-term trading will always impact equities, but that underlying profitability, I think people should feel really good about. And I wanted to come back because, you know, so much will be driven by the investment that happens. But, you know, as you said earlier, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about peak demand. And I agree as like, you know, I think a lot of people misinterpreted that IEA scenario as a forecast or a projection. And I I think it was pretty obvious, you know, as someone who's written reports that it would have been interpreted that way. I call it willful weaponization of a scenario. And I think the IA knew what it was doing. Those are my words, not yours. So (laughs) I don't disagree. And the need to, you know, this need to transition away from oil and gas to lower carbon energy, it was seen as being more important than these supply constraints that seem to be looming out there. I know our former colleagues, your former colleagues at Goldman recently published their 20th edition of the Top Projects Report, which I think you were, you and I were around for the first one. You, you and your team certainly did a lot more work on it. I was a happy consumer of it. And that's kind of placed, as you said, peak Permian on the horizon. I was wondering, how are you thinking about weighing you know, the peak demand versus peak Permian, peak shale? Do you think that we're going to hit a supply crunch at this point? And you know, how many years in the future, if I could press you on that? I think we are going to need to start looking for other areas where we can get oil supply from. Now, again, unlike 20 years ago, where there were individual years where oil demand grew 3 million barrels a day and often was growing over 1.5 million barrels a day, maybe we're trying to solve more now for somewhere between 750 and 1.2 million barrels a day of growth. So more modest growth rate than 20 years ago, but still a growth rate versus the expectation of decline. And the idea that shale can provide 70% of it or maybe even 10% of that is hardly clear. And at some point, I think we are going to probably peak in the Permian and plateau, and maybe that's within the next three or four years. My own views are kind of very similar to what our colleagues, Michele Delavigne, our former colleagues, put out just about a month ago. And so then what does come next? You know, so there's going to be some ability for the OPEC countries to grow. But David, I think even in the course of my 25-year career, it's not obvious Saudi has gone from anywhere other than nine and a half million barrels a day about 20 years ago to 10 and a half million barrels a day. I mean, so I, I know people like to declare that they can produce 12 or 13 or 11 and a half. They've never sustained more than 10 and a half. And I'm, I'm not being bearish Saudi. I'm just looking at the numbers. So let's at least, why can't they demonstrate 
six months at 11 and a half before we declare it a done deal. And so no one's saying they're running out of oil. We're saying they need an investment cycle just like other areas do. Now, is it going to be Canada's oil sands? Are we going to go back to deep water? These are all the areas we're going to have to start looking at. But honestly, we're not even trying so far. There's a little bit of a pickup in exploration. There's a little bit of an acknowledgement. Some of these other areas may make sense, but people aren't even trying. And I will say, when you look at the energy needs for the rest of the world, there is a role for new technologies. We're going to need to have electric vehicles ramp if we're going to meet the substantial energy needs in India, Africa, and so forth. So nothing I'm saying is a knock on the need for new technologies. In fact, just the opposite. It's pretty clear as energy needs grow, we are going to need all the different ways we can get modern energy, including the new stuff. My critique is usually with thinking we can get rid of the old stuff at any point in time before the new stuff's ready for prime time. Yeah, and I mean, it is very strange to think we're in a world now where the U.S. is a leading oil producer. You know, it's a leading exporter of liquefied natural gas. It's strange to think that we're so reliant on the U.S. for our traditional energy supplies at this point. Are you seeing things outside the U.S. where you're like, okay, here's here's where more supply is coming from? Or are we looking to have to meet that strictly from renewables? You know, I might phrase it slightly differently in the sense that I think there's a huge opportunity between the United States and Canada, but also in the Middle East to provide the energy supplies that the rest of the world is demanding. So I agree that in the OECD and the rich Western nations, and it'll include Japan and Australia, New Zealand in there, that oil demand and some of these traditional fossil fuels, probably if they haven't peaked, they're going to peak soon and some amount of decline is going to happen. But then there are these other 7 billion people on earth who use like 20% on a per capita basis of the energy that the lucky 1 billion of using. How do you meet their needs? The world knows modern energy exists. And so it's going to want to use it. And that could be the old stuff. It could be the new stuff. It's going to be all of it. And we have a tremendous opportunity between our crude oil. And we can say the Permian is maturing, but maybe we motivate tier two and tier three to come into being. The state of Alaska, last time I checked, is part of the United States. It's not clear why only Alaska gets labeled as Arctic. Norway is allowed to do $18 billion in new projects. Apparently, Norway, their touching of the Arctic Circle, for some reason, doesn't count good for them from a branding perspective. Canada, oil sands, lots of resource, LNG from both Canada and the United States. This is all the energy the world needs. But we also have some of the best technology sector folks, the best entrepreneurs. And so whether it's electric vehicle technology, battery storage, hydrogen, any of this new stuff, That's also an opportunity for us to go help the rest of the world meet its energy needs. And I think we are uniquely positioned to do that. I'm talking about US plus Canada. We're in the Middle East. It's going to be mostly oil and natural gas that they have to offer the world and maybe not on the cutting edge of some of the newer technologies from a proprietary development standpoint. And I think it is very interesting, David, from again, from 20, 30, 50 years ago to think about the US as being long energy, all forms of energy that as our demand kind of matures and possibly goes down, we can free it up to go to these other areas of the world that clearly need it and are going to want it. Yeah, I think that was a big lesson coming out of the the European energy crisis last year, where fortunately a very warm winter saved a lot of uh, hardship, but there was a lot of hardship experienced in some of the developing countries and in areas like Pakistan and others where the LNG cargoes that were needed in Europe did not show up in other places. And so Unfortunately, I feel like these energy crises always balance on the backs of the poorer countries and poorer people in uh, richer countries. And I think we need to keep that in mind when we think about what we're doing with our energy supplies. And that really shifted the conversation. That's what I wanted to ask you about as well. It seemed like you know during that period, there was a big shift in the conversation, maybe a rebalancing of the energy conversation away from some of the more extreme ESG stances and towards energy security. And I was curious, are we, are we finding a, a path to the middle at this point? And how are investors thinking about balancing the need for secure and environmentally sustainable energy now? Because to meet those opportunities that you talk about, we need investment. And are we going to be able to see reasonable, rational, responsible investment in the industry? I mean, listen, David, doing better on the environment and decarbonizing are important goals. My pushback is they shouldn't be the only goal. And frankly, they'll never be the number one goal. And so this shift to now talking about an energy trilemma, as some have talked about it, where it's a mixture of geopolitical security, reliability, as well as climate and environmental goals, is a step in the right direction. 
but I think still fall short of the reality of the world we live in, which is its availability first and foremost, full stop. And we know that looking at Germany, one of the countries most committed to decarbonizing, Russian gas is cut off and it didn't take five seconds, five seconds for them to restart up coal plants. And David, as you know, Lignite coal, which I'm pretty sure as a non-coal expert, is the worst form of coal that you can actually have. And they somehow decided to do this while retiring their nuclear pants, which is probably for another conversation on another podcast. But the most climate conscious people of the world apparently are burning lignite coal because they couldn't live with that energy for five minutes. And I don't blame them one bit. So what about the other seven billion people on earth that are using three barrels of oil per capita versus the 16 the lucky one billion of us use. You look at a continent like Africa, it's 1.3 billion people that use 4 million barrels a day. That's, that's insane. We use over 20 here in the United States for 350 million people. If Africa goes from using one barrel per capita to three barrels per capita, which by the way, is that sort of rest of world average, that's 8 million barrels a day of oil demand. Now, China grew by 8 million barrels a day over 15 years from, I want to say, 2002 to 2017. I don't know if Africa as a continent will grow that quickly, but that in a nutshell is your energy transition. It is meeting the energy needs of the rest of the world. And the idea that anyone can say, you have to do without, or we want, or you're going to, you know, degrowth, you don't get to grow. It's insanity. It's pure insanity. And none of that is to say, we don't care about environmental and climate goals. We do. But you're going to have to figure out how to meet the people's energy needs first. Hopefully, it's affordable. Hopefully, it's reliable and from geopolitically secure countries. And the goal will be to do it with a better environmental footprint. But it's availability first. It's a hierarchy of needs, in my opinion. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, often what we see is that developed countries are able to kind of leapfrog technological stages. So going wireless instead of stringing up thousands of miles of, of telephone line. Do you see any scope for that with the energy transition? Because if you look in the US, if you look in Europe, like why are we shutting down nuclear plants that have useful lives and trying to replace it when you could be, you know, building next generation technology closer to consumers in the developing world rather than having them need to be reliant on, you know, fossil fuels are very portable. <laughs> it's very easy to, you know, logistically less demanding. Is there any scope for that or is that too much of a pipe dream? It's a great question. And I, and I think one of the, the one of the worst analogies that climate tech people use is sort of the landline to smartphone leap that say India did, and then say, well, instead of using ice vehicles, we're going to use EVs, et cetera, and so forth. And I, smartphones are infinitely better than landlines. There's no chance you'd build a landline infrastructure. It's probably not actually cheaper. Uh, and then clearly, all the benefits of a smartphone, which I don't need to go into here, make it just a no-brainer to switch. But they're also $1,000 or $500 or $200 products. Um, they're consumer products. It's not a whole infrastructure in a system. And while I personally prefer driving an EV over an ICE vehicle, the performance differences, I mean, some people, you know, there's some pros and cons to both of them. It's not obviously better. It's certainly not obviously cheaper. You know, and so I, I might phrase it somewhat differently in the sense that, when you look at energy, you look at a country like China, which imports 10 to 12 million barrels a day of oil, I think there is motivation to switch to EVs. And you'd rather have a coal-fired EV than an OPEC plus fired ICE vehicle. And so I, I think there's a, a misnomer that China is doing this for environmental reasons. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I think they're doing it primarily for geopolitical reasons. I and mean, then when you look at a country like India, they're not going to want to repeat importing 10 million. They're not long oil in India. They're not going to want to import 10 million barrels a day or more. So I think they will be motivated to use EVs for geopolitical reasons. And so when we look at energy, you have to take all these things into account. You can't just focus on, well, for CO2 reasons, India should switch. They're not going to want to import just LNG. And by the way, that means they're going to use a bunch of coal, but they're probably also going to be use a bunch of solar. And so how do each of these countries solve for how do they minimize their insecurity from a geopolitical standpoint? Domestic resource first, solar and wind are domestic, OPEC barrels tend to not be unless you're an OPEC country, and so on and so forth. And I, would, I would encourage that type of analysis by country and region versus the European and US, and I apologize, David, left of center ideology of CO2 is all we care about. It may be all you care about, but until you provide energy for all, you're not going to, I think, get your CO2 reductions that you want. That's such an interesting idea that 
in, in countries in order to get off their dependence on oil, they could switch to EVs and power it by coal. It's, it's such an interesting and important perspective of just if you see EV car growth, doesn't necessarily mean that these countries are doing it for environmental reasons. You got to look at the power source that's ultimately behind those. And I think that's an interesting way to look David, at the data. Yeah, let me just jump in there for one second, because I was I was critical of the left, so let me be balanced and be critical of the right. I think tagging solar, wind, and EVs as simply you know, crazy enviro lefty stuff isn't accurate either. I think we do need these technologies, and it is incumbent upon people on the right and conservatives to figure out how to embrace these technologies, because it is to our geopolitical advantage to pursue them in this country and help these uh, emerging regions develop and meet their energy needs. So I apologize for interrupting, but I just want to make sure I'm balanced. No, I want to make sure everything's balanced and you've been able to say what you intend to say. And maybe with that, you know, one last thing that I really enjoy in your Substack is, I think you put it in your words, is um, taking a longer term focus on shorter term issues. And I think that's great for the middle of the year. As you've said, we've kind of gone through these early innings in the Super Vol cycle. Have things been happening this year that you kind of are taking in and, and influencing the longer term outlook that you have? Are there things that you know have come up that might not seem like a big thing, but may turn out to be a big thing in coming years? So I've, I've tagged it. My super spiked uh, was tagged as sort of a messy energy transition era <laughs> arrives. And I think that tagline is starting to morph into the energy transition needs to transition into kind of what we just talked about with start with availability, figure out how countries can meet their domestic needs through both new and traditional technologies. And then how do you do that in a way that's affordable, but also does take into account environmental and climate concerns. And I think that is some of the short-term volatility and noise. I do think what happened to Europe when Russia in, first invaded Ukraine, $500 equivalent natural gas prices just being caught off energy, it has shifted that conversation at least somewhat in the right direction. It, you may not realize that when they're shutting nuclear plants, but that one major negative issue aside, you know, I think so there's a lot of this short-term stuff I think is contributing to a better understanding of why we use energy and that some of the simplistic landline to cell phone analogies just don't apply here. And, and so I, I do take some hope. I take some hope that I think the conversation is brought in that you are seeing people right of center try and engage on these topics where it's not just a left of center type perspective from a political standpoint. There's still a long way to go on basic education to all sides of the aisle, both here in the United States and around the world. But I am an optimist and I do think progress is being made and I take a lot of comfort in independent voices. So I write on Substack, but there's many other people in many different avenues and people with a range of views, those views are getting out there. People might not like every view, they may not agree with every view, but I take some comfort that energy is elevated to a point of prominence in conversation that we have a chance at least to have better solutions going forward. Yeah, and it's so important, you know, I find like the the need to really think about transitioning our thinking about energy. I mean, back when when you and I were analysts, energy was almost a shorthand for oil and natural gas. Uh, it kind of was like the broader way to talk about the two. And now we really do need to think broadly about all the different ways that we can bring the energy people need to their world. And it requires thinking about not only the supply, the security, the other forms that can come in, the carbon footprint. So I feel like it's being able to talk with you, being able to talk with many other people, that, that, that educational aspect and broadening our own thinking is so important for us all to move forward. But you know, that's a lot of work also. It's the summertime. So I, one thing I wanted to ask you, <laughs> this is uh, you know, our summer playlist series. And so we'd like to ask each of our guests, what are they reading this summer? And what's on your beach reading list or just what are some of the things that you're trying to use to expand your own mind? You know, I'm, I'm a big reader and one of the best and favorite authors has been Vaclav Schmiel. So for people who care about energy, Dr. Schmiel is a professor, I want to say at the University of Manitoba. He is an energy expert and I, to me, does not have an agenda. I, I don't think what he says is right wing or left wing. It is pragmatic. It is truly science-based, analytically based. And he has a bunch of books. His latest one is let me see if I can pull up the title, Invention and Innovation. And I just read it. He is an absolute treasure. Numbers Don't Lie is another good one. The Way the World Really Works is a third one. I would recommend everyone, left, right, center. If you live in an autocratic country, if you live in a democracy, wherever you live, whatever you do, read Dr. Vaclav Schmiel. I love him. Uh, the other book I read is actually an oldie, but maybe a goodie. I'd not read it before is The Big Rich 
which was about the four founding families of the Permian Basin. It's a guy, I think Brian Burroughs, if I have his name correctly, I, th- I think it was written like in the late two- 2009 type time frame. but that was my fun reading. So I'm, I'm a little bit of a loser for sure. Uh, I have a serious energy book and I have a, kind of a fun energy book. I, I probably do need to broaden in my horizons, David. I'll, I'll listen to the other episodes to make sure I get some 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 better, more broad-based recommendations. So, <laughs> Thanks so much, Arjun. <laughs> Thank you. It's such a pleasure to speak with you, David, and, and always nice to be here on Smarter Markets. Thanks again to Arjun Murdy, former head of equity research on the energy sector at Goldman Sachs, partner at Veriton, and the publisher of Super Spiked on Substack. Join us next week as we continue our Summer Playlist 2023 with our next special guest. We hope you'll join us. This episode was brought to you in part by ABAX Exchange. Market participants need the confidence and ability to secure funding for resource development, production, processing, refining, and transportation of commodities across the globe, with markets for LNG, battery metals, and emissions offsets at the core of the transition to sustainability, ABAX Exchange is building solutions to manage risk in these rapidly changing global markets. Facilitating futures and options contracts designed to offer market participants clear price signals and hedging capabilities in those markets essential to our sustainable energy transition. ABAX Exchange, bringing you better benchmarks, better technology, and better tools for risk management. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets by ABAX. For episode transcripts and additional episode information, including research, editorial, and video content, please visit smartermarkets.media. Please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or producer. Smarter Markets, its hosts, guests, employees and producer, ABAX Technologies, shall not be held liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on informational viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Thank you for listening and please join us again next week.